Well, good evening on behalf of the Brazil Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center of the Centro Brasileiro de Relações Internacionais Sabre the Inter-American Dialogue and Prospectiva. I want to, to welcome you here today to the Wilson Center. We are very thrilled, very proud to be able to be together with those institutions, working with them, uh, and uh, they are represented here, the dialogue by Michael Schifter, the president, uh, Peter Haken, uh, the super president, <laughs> uh, and uh, president emeritus of uh, the I dialogue. I like super better. No. <laughs> and uh, also by uh, Denise Gregory, the executive director of the SABRI, uh, and uh, our friend Ricardo uh, Mendes from Prospectiva that has worked us different projects. The idea this morning is to reflect uh, on uh, Brazil-U.S. relations in the framework of leadership and responsibility in the new Brazilian international agenda. And we are very, very uh, honored to have with us uh, a very dear friend of the Wilson Center of the Brazil Institute, of, uh, many of us, uh, Ambassador Tom Shannon. Uh, uh, you have the biographies here. I just wanted to uh, uh, say a few things about Tom Shannon. Uh, I was, as you know, in my previous incarnation, I was a correspondent. And I will tell you now a secret. The first time I noticed Mr. Shannon, it was, I knew about him, but it was in November 2003 in Miami when the uh, uh, FTAA uh, idea basically collapsed. <laughs> the countries could not come, especially Brazil and the United States could not come to an agreement. And uh, I approached it, Tom at the entrance of the Miami Intercontinental Hotel. And uh, he was then an assistant to Condoleezza Rice at the National Security Council. And I asked Tom, what now? And he said, Paulo, there is something that having served in Brazil, that I understand about Brazil and the United States, but I believe about Brazil is that the democratic debate in Brazilian society always leads Brazil to finding its position, recognizing its interests. And he said, and I believe that Brazil and U.S. interests are mostly convergent. And uh, I started really to pay attention to Tom Shannon and say, here is an American that really gets us that understands Brazil. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, and we, and I have been pastoring him ever since as a journalist and now more in this position that I have, that I can pastor people uh, without uh, thinking that I'm doing something bad. So, <laughs> it's sort of, also, we have, I'm very honored to have here a great Brazilian diplomat. Uh, Ernesto Fraga Araújo, he's a minister in our embassy here, the Brazilian embassy in Washington. Uh, you have also his bio, a, a short version of his bio in this. But before we ask uh, Ambassador Shannon and Minister Ernesto Araújo to uh, make their presentations, I would like to ask Peter also to uh, give you a few words of welcome and talk about this this idea of uh, having this discussion today. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you've said almost everything that needs to be said before we get to the main event. Uh, it's, let me just say it's always a pleasure uh, for me personally, for the Inter-American Dialogue, to work with uh, Paulo Sotero and the Brazil Institute and the Woodrow Wilson Center. And uh, 
Uh, I, we're hoping it's going to be a pleasure this morning as well. <laughs> uh, I also want to uh, sort of acknowledge uh, the work, the collaboration of Denise Gregory from Sebre in Brazil. Uh, uh, we were together about a month ago in Brazil with a similar conference in Brasilia, and uh, this is a uh, sort of partnership, a uh, collaboration on, on trying to sort of explore these issues. I don't think there are any real answers. The fact that uh, I think I've been to more meetings on Brazil this year than in the previous five years all put together. and. Uh, Part it's a testament to the work of, of Paolo and uh, Denisi and Sebre, but uh, it also uh, says something about Brazil's new uh, position in global affairs and international affairs. And I guess there's always two questions that uh, worry me and uh, what I hope we'll begin to get at today. And uh, 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 and uh, there are questions that uh, you hear quite a bit in Brazil, you hear them here, is, you know, will Brazil's current stature, influence, profile last, or how long will it last? Is it permanent this time? Are we sort of going to see a continuing rising Brazil, or is this going to be a short-lived uh, spike in, in Brazil's international. I have my answer to that, and I'll discuss it a little bit later. Uh, and second is, how are they going to use this newfound profile, visibility, influence in global affairs? And uh, I think that that question is so open precisely because their uh, uh, rise, Brazil's uh, presence, uh, is so new. It's uh, really to be tested, not uh, that they can emerge in, in such an important position, but how, in fact, are they going to use it? And our first speaker or our first speakers are going to address one part of that that's very crucial. Uh, what is the relationship with the United States going to be like? Is it going to be a partnership? Is it going to be an independent Brazil, indifference, uh, adversarial, uh, how will this evolve? I think that uh, one could make the case for almost any one of those uh, courses. But let me uh, turn it back to Paolo. And yes, and thank you, Peter. It just to, uh, we are very happy because we have uh, not only the audience here, but this is being webcast live, and uh, so, I'd like to give a special welcome to friends in Sao Paulo, Brasilia, Manaus, that where I know they are watching, and uh, other places because we sent a notice uh, to lots of people, and uh, we are very happy to to have this sort of a, a little global event uh, with uh, 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 Ambassador Shannon, Minister Ernesto, to. Uh, start us off with this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Sure, there. there. Yeah. Okay. Anywhere? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank all of you uh, for being here today. And uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here also. Minister, it's, uh, it's great to see you. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to serve on a panel with my colleagues from the Brazilian Embassy. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work together uh, over time, and uh, I think it's been good work and, and fruitful work. Uh, and it's uh, uh, great to, to be here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and especially here at the Brazil Institute, uh, in collaboration with SEBRE and Prospectiva and Inter-American Dialogue. I think this kind of uh, cooperation and coordination between really important institutions in the United States and Brazil to focus broadly on Brazil, but especially on how Brazil and the United States relate to each other. Uh, is, is something that uh, we're going to see more of over time. I think it's something that has been um, lacking, uh, but it's something that we're going to need uh, as we advance because uh, our ability to understand each other and our ability to relate to each other is going to have a lot to do in, in the success or the lack of success in, in our bilateral relationship. So uh, congratulations to all of you who put this together, and, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I came here to the the, uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center and to the Brazil Institute just before I left for Brazil. Uh, I left in February, I think participated in an event in January, shortly ahead of, of my swearing in as the U.S. Ambassador to Brazil. And at that time I made a, a couple of broad points 
uh, about the relationship. Uh, the first one was that uh, although the bilateral component of the relationship would remain important, that the future of the relationship is really global. It's not bilateral. Uh, and as important as some of the bilateral issues might be, they pale when compared to the, the bigger issues that Brazil and the United States confront in the world, whether it be energy security, food security, or the, the fight against transnational crime, or the effort to uh, provide a, a larger a global uh, public good uh, through uh, combined um, activities in the sector of, of health. Uh, the, the other point that I made was that while the future of the relationship was global, the driver of the relationship was no longer going to be governments. It was going to be our societies, uh, and that as our societies connected at, at all levels, uh, our own people, our own citizens were going to be making uh, increasing demands of governments, and the governments were going to have to be responsive in some fashion, and that this was going to be especially challenging to institutions like the Department of State and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which are essentially conservative institutions, and respond slowly and not always adequately to the, the kinds of, of social dynamics that are uh, on the loose in, in both of our countries. Uh, and, that, um, and that finally, the, uh, the, the larger point is that managing this kind of relationship, such a dynamic and complicated relationship, was going to take a lot of creativity, it was going to take a lot of imagination, and it was going to take a lot of understanding and respect. And that it was really uh, up to us as diplomats to, um, to start that process and, and to find a way to channel the energies that are apparent in both of our countries in ways that not only benefit each other but also more broadly our region, our hemisphere, uh, and, and the globe. And in the eight months or so that I've been in Brazil, uh, the three points that I made in January have come home to me uh, uh, with even greater strength. Um, this is my second time in Brazil. I served there from 1989 to 1992. I see Jim Ferrer in the off, uh, audience. He was both uh, my DCM and my charge for a period of time uh, and, and a great foreign service officer and somebody who really knows Brazil well. And, and at that time, if you compare what Brazil was like in 89 and what, what Brazil was like today, um, Donna, you're here also. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, and uh, if, if, if you compare the, uh, the, the two Brazils, what's striking for me is that the, the language and the geography are the same, but that's about it. Uh, everything else has changed in a really dramatic way. Brazil really is a country that's transformed itself politically, economically, and, and socially. Uh, and it's a transformation that's ongoing. Uh, and uh, as this transformation evolves and, and, and emerges, uh, uh, Brazil is going to play not just an increasingly important role, uh, in the world, but a, but a role whose importance grows and evolves as it encounters the world. Uh, in other words, it's, it's really uh, almost an organic process, uh, which um, requires the Brazilians to think about their foreign policy in a new way, and it requires us to think about uh, Brazil in, in, in a new way. So in many ways, the future of our bilateral relationship is going to depend a lot on how well we understand the dynamic inside of Brazil and how well we appreciate and understand the dynamic as, as Brazil reaches into the world and, and engages with that world. And as I kind of made my rounds and, and thought about the relationship, um, one of the things I came away with w was this idea that um, although Brazil has, and the United States historically have had very friendly relationships and have had relationships that have had a a lot of contact over time that the contact has been uh, inconsistent in terms of quality, uh, that our engagement has really been cyclical depending on our interests and Brazil's interests and both countries for a variety of reasons have been easily distracted over time and so we have peaks or, or periods of time where our cooperation is quite intense and quite important and then periods of time where the relationship is really laying fallow uh, for the reasons I noted. Brazil's been busy with its domestic agenda. We've been busy someplace else in the world. Uh, but uh, neither country can afford that anymore. And so our intention and our purpose as, as we engage with Brazil was not only to kind of enhance or increase the, the, the constancy of the dialogue, but also to try to enhance the quality of the dialogue and to raise that dialogue to as high a level as we possibly could and keep it there. And, you know, what we've been able to do over the past eight months, I think, has been pretty significant. We've had uh, a variety of, of high-level visitors uh, into Brazil. 
We started with Attorney General Holder. We had Secretary Clinton. We had Secretary Donovan from Housing and Urban Development. Uh, we had the Secretary of Transportation, uh, LaHood. We had the Deputy Secretary of Education come. Um, we were going to have uh, Secretary Gates uh, visit uh, Brazil as part of a larger swing through the region, uh, but uh, this was right when the Nuclear Security Summit was taking place in April, and uh, President Lula asked Minister Jobim to come to Washington. So Minister Jobim and Secretary Gates met in, um, in Washington. Um, and and uh, aside from that ministerial level contact uh, and several presidential meetings outside of, of Brazil, uh, we've also had just a, a run of undersecretaries and, and, and uh, sub-cabinet level visits that have been striking in their, uh, um, the, their fruitfulness in terms of, of what we've been able to develop uh, in terms of, of building a structure in the relationship and, and, and increasing the content of the relationship. And, and, and this is evident in the agreements that we've been able to reach in a fairly short period of time. We've signed memorandums of understanding on climate change, on uh, the advancement of women, um, and on development assistance in third countries, on uh, implementing smart transportation systems, on um, um, updating our, our larger educational exchange programs. Uh, our Secretaries of Commerce uh, uh, signed an innovation annex to our bilateral commercial MOU. Uh, we signed the Defense Cooperation Agreement, which was a remarkable event uh, considering the response in the region to the Defense Cooperation Agreement we signed uh, with Colombia. We concluded a tropical forest conservation agreement, which had been held in abeyance and negotiated for about 10 years uh, before we were finally able to close it. We're in the process of concluding a totalization agreement, which harmonizes our social security regimes and allows American and Brazilians who, who work in both countries to make themselves whole in their social security systems, no matter where or when they happen to be working in, in each country. And on top of that, we've, um, uh, we did something really remarkable uh, in, in the trade area. We came to terms, or we, we created a process uh, to get us out of a potentially uh, dangerous moment in, in cotton in response to a, a WTO decision uh, in which Brazil was uh, given uh, the right to retaliate against the United States for subsidies that we uh, provide to our cotton industry. Uh, this was a, a worrisome moment for all of us. Uh, because the Brazilians were quite intent on retaliating unless they could get some kind of satisfaction from the United States through some very creative negotiating uh, by uh, uh, our assistant USTR, uh, Miriam Shapiro, and uh, Undersecretary of Agriculture, Jim Miller, plus some um, 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 very skillful negotiating on the Brazilian side. We were able to fashion an, an agreement that effectively postpones any potential retaliation until beyond 2012 in the consideration of our own farm bill. Uh, and in the process, I think, show that, that the United States is intent on abiding by its international obligations uh, under the WTO, uh, but that also the Brazilians were prepared and, and to understand that there was a political reality that we were dealing with, uh, but that we could work together in the short term to address the immediate concerns of the Brazilians while we attempted to address the long-term concerns. I think that was a, an important accomplishment at the moment, uh, and I think it continues to be an important accomplishment. We've also held two meetings of our commercial dialogue. Uh, we just finished one yesterday, uh, and the breadth and the scope of that dialogue is quite significant. Uh, it covers everything from green technologies uh, to innovation to trade facilitation. Um, we've, al we've also held two meetings of the U.S.-Brazil CEO Forum, uh, one an executive level meeting held in Brasilia, the second uh, a full meeting of our CEOs uh, and our governments uh, in Denver, which was held at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And I mean, I, I, could, I could go on and on, uh, but uh, the, the point of all this is just to highlight the fact that, that over the past eight months, uh, we've been working very hard to enhance an already pretty impressive structure uh, to guide and, and manage uh, our dialogue and relationship, and in the, in the process, build a series of agreements that uh, either create a, a, uh, a guideline for deeper engagement in some really key areas of the relationship, or actually advance the relationship in, in, in several key areas. And so I, I think this, from my point of view, was a pretty good start. Uh, we still have a lot to do, uh, but, uh, but I, I think we're, we're well positioned at this point. Of course, we, we did have one significant area of disagreement, which was Iran. All of you are familiar with it, and we're happy to talk about that. 
Um, but I think there what's been important is how we've been able to absorb that on both sides, uh, understand uh, what caused it, understand kind of where it's going, and, and contain it in, a, in an important fashion uh, through a Brazilian commitment to um, abide by the, the UN Security Council resolution and a commitment that, that, that was then made real through legislation in Brazil which implements the UN Security Council resolution uh, and the sanctions uh, against Iran. And while we still have some disagreement about the role of sanctions, uh, there is broad agreement that uh, the objective that we are seeking, the objective that is being sought within the UN Security Council uh, of, a, of an Iran that meets its international commitments and that addresses the profound concern that the international community has about its nuclear program um, is, uh, is one that is shared broadly uh, between Brazil and, and, and the United States. Uh, but as we um, – and, and, and all of this, of course, was done in an environment in which Brazil was moving towards a very significant national political election. Uh, and for me, this is striking because uh, most countries shut down about six months ahead of election. In fact, governments – in democracies, governments shrink when you get close to an election. And decisions end up getting made by only a very few uh, number of people because people on, on the outlying edges of government uh, sometimes feel that they don't have the authority to make these decisions as the larger political forces of a nation kind of move into play. Um, I have not seen that in Brazil. In fact, what's been striking to me is our ability to maintain a level of dialogue and contact and achievement uh, almost up to the date of the election. I mean, the fact that we were holding an innovation summit at Georgetown University on Monday and Tuesday, the fact that we had commercial dialogue yesterday, uh, it for me is, is striking. It means that there's a, a level of, of depth uh, on the Brazilian side, a level of depth on the American side, a clear recognition that our relationship is one based on, on interests, that these structures are going to uh, continue and persevere as guideposts in our relationship. And for me, this is, this is very encouraging. Um, but as we look ahead, uh, I guess I would like to make a, a couple of points, and, and then I'll sit down and let my colleagues speak and, and then let you all speak. I think the first is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Brazil's transformation is an ongoing process. It's not going to reach an end point. It's going to continue to evolve over time. And as it does, that's going to affect how Brazil engages with the rest of the world. And therefore, it's very important for us to stay as close as possible to that transformation process. And we do this through a variety of mechanisms, but one of the most important is participating in some of the most important events that Brazil is going to be working through over the next bunch of years. And interestingly enough, many of those are sports related, whether it's the International Military Games, whether it's the Confederation Cup in 2013, whether it's the World Cup in 2014, or the Olympics in 2016. Um, these are going to be major drivers of transformation in Brazil. Trans transformation of infrastructure, transformation of public security, transformation of public health, and also a major focal point of investment inside Brazil. And the degree to which we can be part of that, the degree to which American companies can be part of it, the degree to which American investors can be part of it, I think, first of all, will um, guarantee the success of the games because we can provide equipment and buildings and material on time and within budget and without uh, corruption, uh, but also I think that, that we have uh, an under understanding of how big events are done. And in fact, we are in the, the process right now of negotiating a memorandum of understanding with Brazil around big events where we can find ways to share our very broad experiences uh, about such events uh, with, with the Brazilians. Um, I, I also think that another interesting aspect of our diplomacy is that we're building social content into the diplomacy in a really interesting way. If you look at the Joint Action Plan to Eliminate Racism and Ethnic Discrimination, if you look at our MOU on the Advancement of Women, if you look at our Biofuels uh, MOU, we are, we are building a, um, a content that we believe directly relates to the needs and interests of our citizens. And on both sides, the Brazilian side and the U.S. side, we're trying to find a way to show clearly to our citizens that our diplomacy has some relevance to them that there's some everyday meaning to, to what it is we're, we're trying to do. Uh, another interesting aspect of the diplomacy is its innovative nature. Uh, we really recognize that when two great democracies in the midst of recreating themselves begin touching each other, uh, they touch each other in, in, in new and different ways. 
and that in order to, to take advantage of that, in order to find ways to, to, to capture the energy that's there in, in a positive fashion, we can't rely on traditional diplomatic methods. Uh, we have to constantly be testing and, and trying uh, new forms of communication and, and dialogue. And this, this is, uh, kind of relates to some of these new structures that we're building. It relates to some of the new social content that we put in our diplomacy. But we're trying to send a very clear message that we're not stuck in the mud, that uh, our conversations are not going to be done through diplomatic notes or, or only through the traditional mechanisms of, of diplomacy, but that we're prepared to explore and go beyond that in, a, in an interesting and exciting way. And finally, I think I'd like to close by saying that Brazil is, a, aside from a country that's in a, a remarkable kind of moment of transformation, uh, it's also beginning a very important national dialogue on foreign policy and international relations. And that's why this event, I think, is so important uh, and why connecting U.S. institutions and Brazilian institutions uh, around this dialogue is so important because I think we have a role to play in the dialogue. And I think the kind of relationship that we imagine uh, for ourselves uh, will affect that dialogue. And as we think about the dialogue and look for ways to engage with Brazilians on it, uh, it's worth noting that most Brazilians today were born uh, after the dictatorship, after the military government. Most Brazilians were born in a democratic era. Most Brazilians were born in an era of expansion uh, in which Brazil has been pushing beyond its historical boundaries. And that what this has created is a Brazil today that is enormously self-confident, has tremendous energy, and a lot of audacity. Uh, and that's not going to stop uh, over the next bunch of years. And what the Brazilians have been able to fashion, which is really a peaceful revolution within a democratic context, and their ability to really break the social justice code and show that uh, democracies and markets can deliver uh, broad, the, the, the broad um, product of social justice, which is economic advancement and um, better education and better health care and better security, uh, is uh, a hugely important goal for the United States. Uh, and one that, you know, we need the Brazilians to be successful uh, in this. Because if they are, it's a profound example, not only in the region, but throughout the world, with all of those countries that are struggling to address development issues within a, within a democratic context. And therefore, you know, as we look for, for new ways to, to connect with the Brazilians, we're going to be doing it at all levels. We're going to be doing it in exchanges between the State Department and Timachi. We're going to be doing it in exchanges at the ministerial level. But we're also going to be tweeting and Twittering and, and using Facebook and ORCID and, and really uh, using social media in, in new and exciting ways. Um, because at the end of the day, what's interesting about how Brazilians and, and Americans relate to each other right now beyond the context of government is that they're not terribly interested in talking points. But what they are interested in are facts. They're interested in a diversity of points of view and they're interested in relationships, and they're interested in understanding how other people live and how they solve problems. And this is something we're really good at. We're really good at opening space. We're really good at promoting dialogue. And in this sense, I, I think we can play a very important role in what comes next. So thank you all very much. Ernesto. Just to underline something that Ambassador Shannon just said. Note that some of you know that, know this, but it's the most popular university course in Brazil today is international relations, which really shows that young people in Brazil has awakened to the fact that we have to engage internationally. I, I find this very interesting. Ernesto. Thank you. <coughs> My presentation here. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Paulo, Professor Hakim. Uh, I'm uh, really, uh, and the organizers uh, of this event, I'm, I'm really uh, delighted and uh, honored to be here among such uh, distinguished company, both in, at the table and in the, in the audience. Uh, two days ago, uh, we took part in a big, uh, huge event here in Washington, the uh, Innovation Summit, the Brazil-US Innovation Summit. Uh, which was a, a wonderful event by uh, any standards. And uh, 
one of the participants uh, at some point asked uh, the following question. He said, uh, we all prayed in the church of partnership, but what does partnership mean? Means? And uh, I would like to uh, suggest uh, some possible uh, answers to, um, to that question. We start with this uh, gentleman, Walt Whitman. Uh, back in uh, late 1889, when uh, Brazil, when he learned that Brazil had just become a republic in November of that year, uh, Walt Whitman wrote this poem from a northern star group to a southern Christmas greeting. Welcome, Brazilian brother, thy ample place is ready. A loving hand, a smile from the north, a sunny instant hail. Let the future take care of it, let the future care for itself, where it reveals its troubles, impediments. Ours, ours, the present throw, the democratic aim, the acceptance and the faith. To thee today our reaching arm, our turning neck, to thee from us the expectant eye, thou cluster free, thou brilliant lustrous one, thou learning well the true lesson of a nation's light in the sky, more shining than the cross, more than the crown, the height to be superb humanity. Um, there are many uh, dimensions, of course, to this brilliant uh, poem of uh, the greatest, perhaps the greatest American voice. Uh, one of the references that is there is uh, certainly to the uh, the uh, Brazilian flags. Uh, this is uh, the uh, the old uh, flag, the monarchical flag of the empire. This was the flag that Brazil first adopted when it became a republic, and this is the uh, American flag at that, at that time with 38 uh, stars, representing the 38 uh, states. Of course, these are the uh, then 21 uh, newly formed Brazilian states replacing the provinces of the empire. Uh, when Whitman talks about uh, more shining than the crown, more than the, the cross, is probably referring to the, although we had stars in the uh, old uh, <laughs> flag, but uh, it's probably a reference to, to this. And it's, um, uh, the design of this flag is, uh, shows very clearly where the, uh, the inspiration for the new republic uh, came from. And uh, Whitman's uh, genius captured that moment brilliantly. Uh, this moment was not a sheer imitation as uh, some Brazilians, I think even today some Brazilians are kind of uh, ashamed of having once adopted that flag, but uh, it was much more the reflection of uh, a dream of becoming uh, more free and more prosperous, uh, like the, the brother to the north uh, was showing that it was possible for a country in the Americas. The uh, more cynical would say, well, this was just a, an imitation of symbols. The social structure in Brazil remained the same, etc. But symbols, uh, I think, run deeper than that, and they represent ideals that can uh, drive concrete transformations. Uh, this was the Brazilian flag for only a couple of months. Now we call it the provisional flag, uh, until probably one day uh, someone arrived and said, Okay, guys, come on. <laughs> right? so, uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we didn't have the trips at that moment, but uh, and then interestingly, they designed this new flag, which is, of course, uh, the same design of the imperial flag uh, with the new symbol of the republic, but keeping the uh, the uh, stars as symbols of the uh, of the new states, right? And this sh shows a lot about. What I think what Brazil is about this reinterpretation and uh, some would say tropicalization of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, of symbols, uh, but to this day the flags of seven Brazilian states uh, follow <laughs> the same pattern. Some more closely, some with the same colors, like Amazonas. Some with the colors of the uh, Brazilian flag, but uh, like uh, I think this is Goiás. Uh, and more interestingly, uh, until uh, 1967. Brazil was officially called the Republic of the United States of Brazil, right? Uh, and this is um, a bill of uh, 100 crusaders that circulated between uh, the 1940s and 1960s. And another interesting thing is that it depicts, of course, the Emperor Pedro II, who had been deposed by the Republic. So it's the Emperor <laughs> Republic, right? <laughs> uh, but right? but it's... Uh, uh, it's also a reflection of this continuity and this reinvention of symbols. Uh, from that series, only one is a Republican, Deodoro da de Fonseca. The other five are, I mean, these are uh, from the monarchy, Pedro the I, the second, uh, Don Juan VI and Princess Isabel, and this is Pedro Álvarez Cabral from the colonial, I mean, the discoverer from the colonial period. So four to one for the, uh, for the monarchy, right? <laughs> right? 
Uh, it shows that there is uh, a national project that remains the same uh, through the different uh, generations and different, uh, and different regimes. Uh, for a long time, this uh, United States of Brazil uh, remained uh, obsessed about comparing itself with the United States of America. Uh, maybe one of the best examples is this uh, wonderful book by Viana Mug, Bandeirantes e Pioneiros. Uh, Bandeirantes are uh, the Brazilian explorers that uh, conquered the hinterland in the 17th century, and of course the pioneers. Uh, and it's, uh, in this comparison, Brazil was normally found uh, lacking. We perceived uh, ourselves in this comparison uh, as a failure. Uh, we had the perception that starting from similar conditions, the, the northern brother had become uh, the most powerful and accomplished country in the world, and Brazil was always a, an underdeveloped promise. Uh, the, the U.S. was and Brazil could have been. But uh, if we thought that we had failed because we were not the United States of America, this showed that we had a, a big idea of ourselves because uh, the U.S. was, uh, of course, the, the, uh, something that we would like to, uh, uh, to be like. So we, we, we in this dream and in this failure, we were still very uh, uh, ambitious. Um, the U.S. was always an, uh, was, n was not a model to imitate. It was uh, rather a proof that, uh, of what a country might become given the opportunities uh, maybe similar to our, um, to our own. I think the United States, was, uh, the United States example was uh, a permanent challenge for, um, for Brazilians. The expectations that Walt Whitman talks about, they were also Brazilian expectations. When uh, Whitman says, the ample place is ready, he seems to know very well what Brazilians felt and feel about Brazil's uh, destiny. There, uh, there has always been a sort of Brazilian exceptionalism uh, not unlike perhaps the American exceptionalism, uh, although with different expressions. Brazil also felt that it had and feels that it has a manifest destiny. But for a long time it was a, a sort of pessimistic exceptionalism. Uh, it was a nostalgia that's something that uh, actually had never been. Even uh, during the, uh, the crisis and the depression of the 1980s when Brazil really felt very low and Brazil felt very bad about themselves as Brazilians, uh, one famous politician said, well, Brazil should be like Australia, right? And uh, people said, no, okay, I mean, let's, let's not settle for, <laughs> okay, I mean, Australia, a great country, but that's not Australia that we'd like to be, right? <laughs> it's something else. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not the United States also that we want to be, but uh, the U U.S. is our reference, our inspiration, our uh, challenge, uh, whatever, because maybe that's because Brazil feels um, uh, exceptional. Uh, I think exceptionalism, exceptionalism has bad press today. This books, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I only read this one, Limits of, Limits of American Power, The End of American Exceptionalism, but I think there are dozens of titles, this End of American Exceptionalism, The Myth of American Exceptionalism. Uh, and uh, I think exceptionalism is really uh, something that should be there if you want to be a country. The whole point of being a country, I think, is feeling exceptional, something different about uh, yourself. And that's perhaps the, uh, the true lesson of a, nation light, of a nation's light in the sky, as Whitman says. Uh, some, uh, Brazil's experience has been that we, uh, we never settled for the, uh, what had called the generic product. We always had wanted to be something uh, in ourselves. Our Latin American uh, neighbors and brothers uh, sometimes, I think, have considered Brazil to be a megalomaniacal and even delusional when uh, 20, 30 years ago we said that Brazil uh, was a, a global player. I think they tacitly asked us, uh, why aren't you, Brazil, satisfied with being just another Latin American country? Well, because that's not just what we are, uh, and what we, we are, in a sense, is what we uh, want to be. Uh, in uh, in one of our kids' uh, history school book, uh, there's a, here in, in the McLean uh, Middle School, there's a, a glossary at the end, and when it says Brazil, it says Brazil, country in Eastern South America. And okay, that <laughs> <laughs> just that period. That <laughs> that's uh, that's our address, right? But uh, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but uh, uh, and it's like you say, well. United States, all country in North, North America between Canada and Mexico. Uh, 
Uh, and the United States is not that. The United States is the, the city upon a hill. It's the, uh, the light unto the nations. And uh, that's what makes the countries, I mean, not, not their addresses, right? Although geography is a, a big determinant, of course. Uh, I think this kind of uh, yeah, idea sometimes uh, misses, uh, misses the point. Uh, the idea that Brazil uh, can be subsumed as uh, just uh, a country in Eastern South America. But interestingly, and this maybe could give rise to another presentation, uh, in this uh, uh, administration, the era of, of Lula, uh, Brazil, at the same time that it became uh, more of a global player, it also became more South America, more engaged in South America, and this would lead perhaps to a new uh, discussion that uh, we don't have the time for here. Um, but th this whole question of attitude uh, was and is determinant for Brazil's uh, development. The idea of Brazil's intrinsic uh, grandeur, like uh, General de Gaulle would say, uh, Brazil's uh, calling to be big and to be among the biggest, this was uh, and is a, a powerful political concept. Uh, it's not, not just rhetorical, it's a concept that survived through the generations, through the troubles and, Im and impediments, like Whitman says, and that is bearing fruit now. The idea, the idea or ideal uh, uh, that Brazil is uh, what uh, it wants to be would be uh, maybe impossible without looking at the success of the United States. Uh, and uh, this ideal has been a tremendous force for mobilization and articulation between state and society in Brazil. Uh, and uh, in all the, uh, the jumps in our development history, uh, it has been uh, a, a, powerful, uh, a powerful concept under Getulio Vargas, under Juscelino, under the military, and, and now certainly under Lula. Um, what characterizes this uh, current jump in, in Brazil, uh, in a sense, is, what, uh, is that it's based on a, a, deep, a deep national feeling. Um, and I think it's a pity that we can say it very comfortably nationalism, because nationalism acquires negative undertones. But I think nationalism would be the correct word here. Uh, but also democracy and humanism, or human development, as we would say nowadays. Also, interestingly, concepts that are already there in uh, Whitman's poem, nation, democracy, humanity. These concepts uh, can perhaps be united under what, under what Brazil, what in Brazil we call uh, citizenship, cidadania, which uh, in the deepest sense is this identification of people uh, and uh, society and inst uh, people and, and the institutions of state and society, which I think can be symbolized by this moment during the Direta Ja movement in 1984. Right? Uh, um, economic growth and uh, stability are, of course, indispensable as conditions to attain the, this ideal that Brazil entertains of itself as a country, but. Uh, it's not sufficient. Brazil is not just a GD GDP, it's, it's a nation. Uh, I think we all feel goosebumps when we hear the national anthem, and th that means a lot. Uh, uh, and uh, globalization uh, has not meant the end of that. Globalization has not meant the end of the nation state, as some people said. Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, globalization has been especially favorable to countries uh, with what we would call it an autonomous national project, but what, I mean, we could call nationalist countries in the good sense, countries with a strong national feeling like Brazil, or India, or China. Uh, since 1990, according to recent statistics uh, from the uh, CEPAL, uh, poverty has decreased in Latin America, but also according to other statistics in Asia and other regions. Uh, and at the same time, um, the uh, relative power of developing countries has grown. So the, the uh, commonplace that globalization leads to, uh, uh, to a concentration of power and to a, a concentration of wealth uh, is not uh, perhaps uh, the reality. And, uh, but the success of uh, globalization creates uh, perhaps an optical illusion for some people. Um, because countries like Brazil uh, are becoming more relevant. Some people think that countries like the U.S. is becoming less relevant, but that's clearly not the case. Uh, for Brazil, especially, it's not the case. Uh, because of the fact that Brazil today is more confident, more active, more engaged with uh, all regions of the world, 
and all, uh, in all areas of activity. Because of that, we come uh, much closer uh, to the global player par excellence, which is the United States. But this is not a question only of uh, power or projection. Uh, I think it's a question of uh, values, symbols, uh, ideas. This is a, uh, from another uh, Walt, from uh, Walt Disney, a movie from 1942, uh, which is in English is called Saludos Amigos. <laughs> it, uh, in Brazil is Alô Amigos, uh, and that's the part in Brazil when uh, Donald Duck meets uh, Joe Carioca. And uh, it's a wonderful symbol, and I think we should, it's there because I, th I think we should reinvent uh, our symbols uh, and reinterpret and uh, create uh, new concepts for our, our dialogue. Sometimes I think we are stuck in old concepts in our uh, in our relations, because it's uh, on the basis of uh, uh, of ideas that Brazil and U.S. can enjoy a unique uh, relationship. These two uh, star groups are both based in, again to quote Walt Whitman, the democratic aim, the acceptance, and the faith. These are aims that and values that not everyone partakes in the world. And that Brazil and the U.S. partake, not accidentally, but structur structurally, since the beginning of our independent lives. Uh, here is, oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, the, uh, the cry of Ipiranga, independence of death, of course, independence of Marche. This is Patrick Henry shouting, give me liberty or give me death. Uh, uh, people say that this never happens. I think that here also people say that this was not, not really like this, that he didn't say uh, or someone else did. Uh, some people say that Dom Pedro was uh, actually uh, riding a mule and... Uh <laughs> 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 but, uh, I mean, this is, this is myth. That this is what we, we need to, to build our, our nations around, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, as I think this was uh, the impression that, that we had in events like this and uh, since the two months that have been in, in Washington is that uh, the U.S. is getting Brazil, is getting the new Brazil in a way that, for example, Europe is not getting Brazil or other players in the world are not. Uh, maybe uh, Brazil and the U.S. Uh, can really do a lot together, uh, and that's because of their exceptionalisms and not in spite of their exceptionalisms. Uh, uh, they can do something everywhere, uh, in environmental issues and social issues and developmental uh, issues, uh, global governance, in the civilizational discussion that is going on around the world, which the U.S. and Brazil can certainly together help to transform from a clash of civilizations into a dialogue of civilizations. But uh, Ambassador Shannon, of course, spoke brilliantly about all the opportunities that we have in the, the relationship. I would just like to point that um, uh, it's all of these opportunities are uh, enhanced by this, uh, this brotherhood that Walt Whitman uh, talked about with all the genius of his foresight already in 1889. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will have some moments for questions now to Ambassador Shannon, to Minister Araujo, and uh, I'd like to, I just noticed the presence here of a great friend, Ambassador Portales from Chile, and you're welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. Uh, Peter. Uh, I couldn't uh, avoid noting the goodwill that exists uh, between the Ambassador and the Minister and the sort of the way they describe the relationship between the countries. And it just occurred to me a question that uh, I thought that I might at least bring out here that uh, uh, the minister suggested that uh, the U.S. is getting Brazil. That's the exact words as recently. Uh, I think Tom Shannon uh, described this uh, numerous U.S. officials traveling to Brazil, the amount of communication that exists between Brazil and the United States. And I just, the question that emerges uh, is, uh, why was the communication so bad or appeared so bad on two such important issues as Iran and on Colombia uh, with the bases? Uh, was it the Brazil stubbornness, the U.S. stubbornness, the stubbornness of both? Was it accidental? 
But it just seemed to me that the two countries uh, weren't communicating before, and then they sort of clashed, uh, you know, at the moment. <clears throat> That's the first question. Then it gets more complicated. So, <laughs> um, well, um, uh, Colombia and and Iran are two very different um, uh, events, and the, the defense cooperation with with Colombia. Um, uh, we can talk about this all day, uh, uh, but but ultimately the the bottom line there is that you know we we in Colombia were negotiating an agreement and we really were in no position um, to discuss at at great length that agreement um, with anybody in the region until we knew what that, what that agreement was going to be, um, and and that agreement was leaked uh, in Colombia uh, and caused. Uh, uh, a kerfuffle uh, in the region as people tried to understand uh, what the agreement was. But, but I, I think what's important coming out of, of that experience is that, um, uh, is that the Brazilians actually worked in, in the aftermath. The Brazilians actually worked, I think, pretty hard in the region um, to calm things down and, and to try to make clear uh, to other countries that um, Colombia had a, a, a certainly a right and all the authority uh, invested in a sovereign nation to uh, to do these kinds of bilateral agreements with other countries, uh, and the fact that we were able to conclude a defense cooperation agreement with Brazil shortly afterwards, the first such agreement in more than half a century, uh, was uh, was quite remarkable. So, I mean, I, I would actually argue that um, uh, that that while uh, the, uh, the the in the run up to the agreement, neither we nor the Colombians were terribly interested in talking to anybody about the agreement until we knew what that agreement was going to be. Uh, that once the agreement was public, we were able to deal with the larger concerns well, uh, and we were able to involve the Brazilians in a way that, uh, that actually led you know, to our own bilateral defense cooperation agreement. And, and in regard to Iran, I would actually say the communication was really good. Um, I, I would say, in fact, that it was quite transparent. Uh, uh, and at almost all levels, uh, our presidents spoke about Iran a lot. Uh, our Secretary of State and the Minister of Foreign Affairs spoke about Iran a lot. Uh, our Undersecretary spoke about Iran a lot. And I spent a lot of time uh, at Itamarachi and elsewhere um, talking about Iran. And I'm sure my colleagues at the Brazilian Embassy spent a lot of time at State Department and in our Congress and elsewhere talking about Iran. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, the, um, you know, if uh, uh, there was a, a clear understanding that, uh, that, that President Lula working with the Turks was intent on, on exploring um, just how far uh, Brazil and Turkey could get with Iran. And uh, I, I think in, in many ways the, the agreement they reached was a significant one in the sense that it showed just how far Iran was prepared to go to avoid sanctions. Uh, you know, it wasn't far enough from our point of view. It obviously wasn't far enough f uh, from the point of view of almost all the members of the Security Council. Um, but. Um, uh, but there was a, a, a difference, obviously, in the vote on the Security Council, and it was linked, uh, you know, to an understanding of wh whether or not sanctions are viable or not, with Brazil arguing that uh, sanctions, uh, once enacted, uh, would lose their, their efficacy uh, and that uh, the, in the international community required more time to explore the, Te the Tehran Research Reactor Agreement and, and determine what more could be gotten from, from Iran. Uh, with most of the other members of the Security Council disagreeing and believing that actually the Tehran Research Reactor Agreement confirmed that sanctions were an effective approach and, and that uh, we needed to stay on a, a double track and maintain pressure on Iran as we sought to negotiate a more comprehensive uh, agreement. Um, but as I noted, uh, that difference uh, did not impede us from closing ranks in the aftermath of the vote uh, and implementing those sanctions. And I, I think that's very important, and I think it, it highlights the larger point I made, which was that there was uh, there's general agreement uh, between Brazil and the United States and, and the rest of the, the, uh, the, the Security Council on the importance of, of holding uh, Iran to its commitments. Ernesto Jonas. Thank you. Uh, just, just to add uh, two points about uh, the Iran issue, uh, I think it's clear, clearly um, Brazil and the U.S. Are, are playing the same game. Of course, each one has different uh, cards in, the, in its hands, but uh, the, uh, the objective is, uh, is the same, is a constructive one, is 
uh, to build m peace and, and cooperation. So uh, maybe it's rather a question of uh, tactical moves that uh, can lead to this or that uh, result. But the uh, the important thing is that uh, the uh, it's all based on on uh, on shared uh, goals in in this I issue, and uh, on. Colombia, it's interesting because uh, during a, maybe a, a couple of decades, uh, Colombia was perhaps in South America, the country that was more distant uh, or most distant uh, from Brazil. Uh, and uh, this happened before uh, the, uh, the, milita the uh, military cooperation agreement between Colombia and the US. Uh, and, and now that this agreement is in place and that we uh, also have uh, uh, evolved uh, with the U.S. in security and, and defense issues. Uh, Colombia is much closer to Brazil than it was uh, before. So uh, the fact that uh, Colombia has a, a very good relationship with the U.S. doesn't mean that it has a, a bad relationship with Brazil. On the contrary, the uh, first visit by the newly elected uh, President uh, Santos from Colombia has been to Brazil. Uh, we are much more engaged with Colombia now. Uh, Colombia is much more engaged with us. So it's clearly also... a, a a, an example that uh, we share goals of the uh, U.S. In, in the region and that we uh, uh, can can act together. Thank you. Questions, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly Myman with McClarty Associates. Um, I'm wondering if either of you might be able to comment with respect to how the governments are viewing the upcoming presidential transition in Brazil. I think that um, how. Uh, our governments have handled presidential transitions with Donna, your tenure being a, a great example, um, have really um, you know, helped us to ensure that our relationship and all the great initiatives that Tom outlined stay on the right track. I'm wondering uh, if there's any initial planning that you're able to share as far as uh, engagement in the coming months. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, it's his transition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not our transition. Uh, it, no, it's an excellent question, and, and thank you very much, Kelly. And um, I, I, uh, I feel that as U.S. ambassador in Brazil, um, I have an incredible luxury, uh, and, and that luxury is um, we're quite indifferent to the results of the election. Um, this does not mean we're indifferent to Brazilian democracy. Quite the contrary. Uh, what has been striking for me about Brazilian democracy is is how quickly it consolidated itself, you know, in the aftermath of the return of civilian power in 1985, and how institutions, which at that time, when I was in Brazil, were viewed as nascent and untested, and uh, and there was real concern about uh, the ability of those institutions to manage all of the different energies that were coursing through Brazil. Uh, how well that has worked, how well those institutions have worked. Uh, and from our point of view, Brazilian democracy is consolidated, it's institutionalized, and it has shown this you know, through um, the superb executive leadership that Brazil has had over the last 16 years. Uh, and, and so um, as, as we look at the elections, uh, you know, given you know, our confidence in, in the democratic institutions, given the, the obvious uh, well-functioning of Brazil's electoral system, uh, and its electronic voting will allow us to know the results of the election on October 3 very quickly. Um, we, are, we are looking at a, a, a quick transition, whether, whether we know the winner in October or November, depending on the results, and we're quite prepared to engage with whoever that winner might be. Um, because from our point of view, the, the relationship is, is, I think, so well grounded in interests and values uh, that we feel quite comfortable um, working across the Brazilian political spectrum and working with whoever emerges as a winner. Yeah, I think you, Ambassador, had already said that normally countries shut down <laughs> before elections, and, and Brazil is clearly not, not shutting down. So it, it already shows a lot that any transition uh, can be a very uh, smooth uh, indeed. Um, I personally had uh, that impression in this, uh, to quote again, this uh, meeting, the uh, Innovation uh, Summit that we just had. It was a huge initiative with uh, top people from uh, government, industry, uh, uh, um, entrepreneurs uh, and uh, academia from from both countries, uh, well almost 200 from Brazil here in Washington, and uh, I didn't hear. Maybe I was in the other room, but I didn't hear anyone say, "Well, mm, what are we going to do now?" Um, the election, right? No one said. No one is saying that. People are really uh, going forward and and planning new initiatives, and uh, I didn't hear the word election or transition mentioned. 
So uh, it's uh, not only business as usual, but uh, more business uh, uh, right. than usual. Than usual. <laughs> very, <laughs> yeah, very interesting thing in 2002 to 2003. It was an innovation in Brazil, thanks to cooperation, when uh, I think Pedro Parente came with a team and uh, to learn how American administrations made the transition and it was very useful and I think if you talk to Pedro Parente or to Antonio Palossi that were in charge of there, they're very grateful for the experience and I think uh, President Cardozo set a new standard in terms of transitions in Brazil uh, that will be tested now. Uh, Miguel, and then we go to him. Miguel Diaz, Congressional Staff. Uh, I want to get to my question to the dangers of maybe overreaching and trying to uh, live up to these lofty ideals of what you think your global place in the world are. And, and, and what leads me to this question is the fact that you have two of Brazil's neighbors, Argentina early in the 19th century and Venezuela currently, who also saw themselves as having a global role and, and their efforts to get there didn't necessarily serve the interests of their peoples. Uh, I guess in answering my question, I, I want to know two things. One is, what, what are the competitive advantages of Brazil that positions it to be a global player? And two, what are the warning signs that you see out there that, that potentially uh, uh, dictate that the country might be overreaching? Who wants to get that one? <laughs> I think that's for the Brazilian, right? Yeah. Yes. No, I can take that one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the dangers of overreaching uh, are always there for, uh, maybe for any country uh, when it starts to, uh, to grow. It's the, the pains of uh, growth uh, itself, they involve, involve that risk, the risk of uh, hubris, right? Of thinking you, you can go uh, beyond your means. Um, the examples of Argentina and Venezuela are interesting because in, in the light of wha what uh, we talked about in terms of, uh, of models, the uh, Argentinian model, when uh, Argentina had the dream of being a, a, a big power, uh, its dream perhaps was to be a, another European country just stranded in, in South America. Uh, and and uh, Venezuela's dream, I don't know what it is. Uh, of course, it, it wants to be a bigger player than it was, and it is today. But uh, I don't think it uh, has the intention of being a global player in, uh, in the broadest uh, sense, maybe uh, to lead some ideological discussions. But uh, uh, again, maybe th the model that they have is, is Cuba and, and, and not the model of uh, a great world power. So um, the ambitions are, are different. And uh, this points to maybe we have a, a bigger risk of <laughs> overreaching than them because our, the ambitions are clearly uh, uh, bigger. But uh, I think people in Brazil are very conscious of the, the shortcomings, the many shortcomings that we still have. What we call the uh, social debt is not paid far from that. Uh, but the, the idea that, that things are changing is immensely important. I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s when no one thought things were changing, maybe in the beginning of the 70s, but changing without democracy, so uh, it was not sustainable. Uh, but then late 70s, the 80s, uh, I mean, uh, everything that could change, we thought would, could change for the worse. Uh, so the, the, the political drive for, for change is immense. And this drive I is interesting because uh, there's a clear notion that we cannot project abroad what we are not at home, and that you need a strong basis in terms of institutions, of your society working well, and that you cannot uh, lead the international fight against poverty if you have uh, hunger uh, within your frontiers. So the, the, the fights are very much uh, inter, uh, interconnected. Uh, so because of, of that, of that notion that the, uh, what you project is what you are, and what you are is where you have to uh, uh, work uh, with, uh, because of that, I think the, the risk of uh, overreaching is, uh, is going to be uh, avoided, I think. Thank you. Yeah. As an observer, um, I, I would say that what's striking to me 
about uh, this larger national dialogue that's taking place in, in Brazil right now about its role in the world is all about how far it can reach. Uh, and in fact, the, the larger debate in, Iran, in, in, in Brazil about Iran is really not about Iran, um, uh, except for a very small group of experts. It's really about how far, how far can Brazil reach and how far can, can it be effective. Uh, and what's interesting about this debate is that it's, it's really a debate between people who argue that Brazil needs to be more modest and others who believe that Brazil needs to be more audacious. Um, we've had the same debate in the United States at different times in, in, in our history. Uh, and uh, uh, the people who argue for audacity always win because that's the way we are. We're, we're expansive nations. We have, as the minister noted, we, we have views of exceptionalism. We have views of our, our, our ability, a confidence of our ability to project ourselves. Um, but what will be challenging, I think, for Brazil in the long term is that Brazil is the first continental-sized country that has attempted to insert itself in the world only through soft power um, and not through warfare, uh, uh, whether it be cataclysmic events um, like world wars or, or local wars. Uh, and, and that is, is uh, uh, unique. And how that happens and, and how it evolves over time, I think, is going to be very instructive for the world. Hugh Schwartz, how have uh, Brazil's ties, increasing ties to China, influenced the relations between the two countries, between the United States and Brazil? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, China is clearly influencing uh, everyone, and uh, I said that uh, the U.S. clearly gets Brazil. Uh, I don't know if Brazil gets the U.S. By the way, but uh, uh, I don't know if Brazil or the U.S. get China. I don't know if anyone is really getting China. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, Brazil has been, uh, on one hand, very uh, cautious uh, in engaging uh, China, but at the same time, very ambitious in terms of economic, but also technological relations, trying to to uh, do the most from the uh, the relationship. Of course, we have challenges similar to the U.S. and other countries in terms of uh, 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 challenges to our, our markets and our production at home. But I uh, know it was not your question. It was how it affects uh, Brazil and the U.S. relations. And uh, I think mayb maybe not directly, but um, Brazil is uh, in the forefront of a, uh, an effort to uh, have more coordination uh, among the, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, although it's not a, a bloc that's going to lead to any sort of uh, agreement or pact, but uh, it's a question of better understanding each other and what they can do or not do uh, in uh, global governance. And at the same time, we have this uh, wonderful dialogue with the U.S. in so many uh, areas. So these things can can somehow uh, converge and the, the perceptions that we bring from uh, BRIC dialogue and to from bilateral dialogue with China uh, can can add up to uh, the perceptions of how Brazil and the U.S. together can can do things together and, and, and fit in, in the world. But uh, we have, uh, again, similar, f feel similar uh, uh, misgivings about, uh, about the uh, the economic uh, power of China in our in our markets, but uh, I think the, the, the dominant note is one of the immense opportunities that this represents. Of, of also, the immense I interdependency that is developing between uh, China and um, and uh, the rest of the world. We uh, used to see everything made in China, but okay, it's made in China, but it's made for whom? For, it's made for us, for, I mean, uh, right? It's not, uh, it's not a question of only uh, China benefit, benefiting from everything that's happening. If we are buying their products, it's because we're benefit, benefiting too, and if we are receiving their investment, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, an interesting aspect that sometimes is not uh, taken into account is the uh, increasing presence uh, of the Chinese in uh, areas that they were not traditionally present in like Africa, for example, while Brazil is uh, trying to be uh, and, and maybe managing to be much more active, and the US <laughs> too. So, uh, uh, in, in some, some places, whenever we're there, suddenly we find each other. Uh, the US, Brazil, and China said, Well, we're here. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's a challenge to, to see what we can, we can do together. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I believe, as Assistant Secretary, you were the first one in that capacity to visit China, right? Correct, yes. 
Could you reflect a little bit on that? Because obviously, you um, had that on your radar. Well, I can, I can only say that, that you know, once we started our um, U.S.-China dialogue on Latin America, which was the product of a, a larger strategic dialogue taking place between the United States and, uh, and China, uh, not only in terms of our bilateral relationships, but also looking at, at how we are encountering at each other around the world. Um, one of my Brazilian colleagues approached me and said that uh, Brazil was planning on having a dialogue with China about the United States. Um, so <laughs> <That's the answer. laughs> which we welcomed, of course. Um, uh, uh, but, but obviously, you know, the China's presence is, uh, is, is big, it's growing. Um, the, uh, the, the Chinese are very serious about, about Latin America. Uh, they're very good uh, when it comes to Latin America. They've learned a lot of lessons in Africa and Southeast Asia, and they're attempting to, to apply them in Latin America, um, especially in terms of, of using uh, what are, are uh, uh, essentially purchasing agreements and transferring those in, into something deeper um, throughout the region. And, and, and their, um, uh, the, the presence is, is not hostile as far as the United States or other countries are concerned, but it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's competitive. Um, because of the advantages the Chinese bring in terms of, the, of what they can buy, how they can finance, uh, and, and therefore it's something we need uh, to have our eyes open to and need to be able to, to respond to, especially as U.S. businesses um, compete with Chinese businesses uh, uh, throughout the region. Um, but, uh, but, but ultimately, these, these are not um, zero-sum games. Uh, that this is just part of a, a much larger and, and more competitive environment that, that we operate in. And I think what it means is in terms of U.S.-Brazil relations uh, is that uh, the United States needs to recognize that we're not alone, that we're not the only option or the only alternative anymore, quite the contrary, we're one among several, and that as we engage uh, with countries like Brazil, we need to, 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 to show that, you know, on a daily basis that we're relevant to, to Brazil's success, that we bring things to the table that, that other countries don't. Uh, although it, it is striking, as I kind of listen to the, the, the debate within Brazil about China, um, uh, and especially as I talk to uh, Brazilian businessmen who are encountering Chinese competition outside of Brazil in markets that, that the Brazilians have been working in for quite some time, uh, that, uh, you know, originally when the China as a phenomenon appeared, there was some talk uh, in Brazil about China being a counterbalance to the United States. That's flipped. Now the talk is about the United States being a counterbalance to China. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we, I think we are concluding near this part because we already took a lot of time from Ambassador Sh Shannon busy schedule also Ernesto's and so, uh, but I would like you to stay put because we'll just do a little quick switch here and I will invite uh, Professor Albert Fishlow to come up and Denise Gregory from Sabri who will lead the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.